one of those Old Testament prophecies from the old prophet Isaiah. So much of Isaiah gets lifted up during a time of year. This time of year in Easter, because Isaiah was a prophet, along with all those other prophets back in the Old, Test the old Testament. The Old Testament prophets were sometimes called seers, S-E-E-R-S, -E -E seers, because they were able to see things from, from God to be shared with others. They were his spokesmen. What they spoke, God had spoken to them to speak to the people that they were going to. Much of what they saw dealt with current events, as we pointed out before, but much of what the prophets saw also dealt with the future, somewhat not so distant future, a little further out, and then finally all the way out, even all the way through the book of Revelation, all the way into eternity. And when we look at the prophecies, we need to look at them that way, and that's certainly what we're dealing with today. Many times, like in today's text, God dealt with a current event through a prophetic message, and the revelation also dealt with the future at the same time. So we see this key verse that we're going to look at, verse 14, spoken to Ahaz by Isaiah as a sign, but it's also a sign for the world that Emmanuel truly is coming, was coming back in this time. He is here now. He is here with us. And as we, so as we look at this, the current event in Isaiah chapter 7 is the deliverance of this king Ahaz of Judah from the plot of the kings of Syria and Israel to dethrone him. Ahaz is aware this is going on. This is an obvious plot, and he is fearful. And he has done all kinds of things to appease these kings. Kind of, he's made alliances with them. He's given him some of the goods out of the temple, which was a common practice because a lot of the enemy nations around wanted stuff from that temple because there was a lot of, a lot of rich stuff. And for some of them, they thought, well, maybe if we have that, that'll take whatever they think is the presence of God. It'll take some of that away and dilute some of that. All kinds of stuff would go on with that. So Ahaz is kind of hooking up with the enemy here by making alliances that are not good. And the current event in Isaiah chapter 7 is the deliverance of King Ahaz. The future event is the deliverance of the human race from sin by Emmanuel, God with us. So this had an incredible prophetic impact. Matthew, the gospel writer, comments that this was a fulfillment of the Isaiah's prophecy. In Matthew 1, 23, he quotes Isaiah 7, 14 and applies it to the miraculous virgin birth of Christ. And he uses that to help settle Joseph. <laughs> Joseph is, I think we could all understand why his fiance has come to him and said, guess what, honey, I'm pregnant. And he uh, just couldn't, he's beside himself. A lot of issues with that. Well, Joseph, as it points out in Matthew, being a righteous man, wanted to do as right as he could by Mary. So he decided to divorce her quietly. An engagement back in his time was seen almost like a marriage. So he decided to kind of bring that, to break that covenant between the two of them quietly. He didn't do what was then and still is lawful, that anyone caught in adultery could be stoned to death. He didn't want to do that. You want to have that going on with Mary because he did love her that much that he would do this. But the angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, it's all right. What's happening here is a fulfillment of a prophecy. He quotes this verse from Isaiah uh, chapter 7, verse 14. <clears throat> and we, we've seen that. That's where the, all this business today is from is Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child, and will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. So it's, it's an incredible thing. So we said that Isaiah was a seer. Do we see what Isaiah saw? Are we able to see that? Are we able to see the fulfillment of a promise? We're kind of in the... Uh, 
the aftermath of all that's happened. We're not being prophesied to of what's going to happen in the future. What we have is the benefit of seeing what has happened, and now we live in the benefit, in the wake, in the joy of all of that. Do we see what Isaiah's prophecy teaches us about Christ and Christmas? First of all, number one, Faith in God's promise is the only way to find true peace in times of trouble. It's the only way to find true peace. It's important to note that Ahaz was not a righteous king, even though he's an ancestor of Jesus, because he was a descendant of David. His life and rule did not please God. He offered sacrifices to pagan idols. He even gave away the temple treasures, as we said. He wanted the king of Assyria to protect him, from the kings of Syria and Israel. It's like reading today's headlines, isn't it? All these countries still at war with each other. Still at war. The gold and the silver items from the temple that had been set aside for the sole purpose of worship of Jehovah were carted off to Assyria. Instead of forging an alliance with a wicked king, Ahaz, with a wicked king, which was what Ahaz was doing, he should have stood firm in the faith. And that, that is the problem. And as we see that, Ahaz kind of threw away his faith. And, and he's in the process of, of saying, you know, the head of the Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, God said through Isaiah, you will not stand at all. Well, Ahaz did not stand firm in the faith. It wasn't too long after all of this, that uh, things began to come apart. Up north, all the more, the people in the northern kingdom, Israel, were scattered. 125 years after this prophecy, the people in the southern kingdom, where Ahaz is in Judah, were exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar and all the people. Things unraveled in this whole part of the world. And we keep saying, how God worked with, through all this unraveling, all of this turmoil to bring about his promise. To keep the, the Davidic line, the Davidic lineage as it's often referred to, that ancestry, to keep that intact was incredible. But there was always a remnant and God kept working through the individuals, through circumstances, through life, all the way to Mary and Joseph. It's incredible. God still does that, by the way. We pointed out that he's done it with his word. He's preserved his word. You know, Isaiah is using the word that God spoke directly to him. We have those words here in this book. This is one of God's signs for us. What we celebrated this morning was also one of God's signs. When we speak of signs, God invited Ahaz to ask for a sign. Just ask me for a sign. Ahaz said, I'm not going to tempt the Lord that way even after God invited him to ask for a sign. Well, Ahaz didn't want one, but Isaiah gave him one anyway from the Lord. This will be a sign. This is what's going to happen. So as we keep on moving through this, in his book, Get Out of Your Own Way, Mark Goulston, a medical doctor, talks about overcoming self-defeating behavior. One chapter is devoted to the mistake of letting fear run your life, which is exactly what was happening with Ahaz. Fear instead of faith that was running his life. Stan was a 52-year-old mechanical engineer at an aerospace company that drove 40 miles to work each day. Then he had a car accident. After a short recuperation, he was fine physically, but he remained injured mentally. He was terrified of driving, didn't want anything to do with it. To preserve his job, he braved it out as a carpool passenger, but rode white knuckles all the way. The only driving he did was to drive other people crazy around him because of his nervousness when he was riding with them. Ruth was a 43-year-old school principal and a mother of three. When she discovered that her husband, Ted, was having an affair, she went into a tailspin. Despite Ted's elaborate displays of remorse and his sincere efforts to work through the marital problems that contributed to his infidelity, Ruth could not overcome the paralyzing uh, fear that she felt and the dread that she felt whenever he was out of her sight. It got so bad that her own life came to a standstill. But what do Stan and Ruth have in common? They were both trauma victims who were terrified to the point 
of incapacity by the fear of reoccurrence. They were living in fear. Ahaz was incapacitated by fear. Dr. Goulston goes on in a chapter describing how people get to the point where they let their fear run their lives. He also gives several excellent suggestions for taking action. And one of those, just from his book, from this, realize that apprehension and avoidance can be more damaging than whatever you're afraid of, rather than attacking it head on and dealing with it, talking about it with someone that can help. God's suggestion is even better than this, though. His suggestion, he tells us that when we're in trouble, he will be with us. Emmanuel represents the promise that God is with us. And I think it's hard for us to imagine that or to realize that. It's not imagining, it's realizing it. To realize God is in this with us. He's here. Sometimes our problems can seem so huge, it's just like putting an object in front of your face and you can't see what's behind it. And that object can be whatever it is that we're afraid of, that we're afraid to tackle, that we're afraid to deal with. And that blinds us for everything. It blinds us even from God and his grace and his love and his presence. Which leads us to the next way that we should apply what Isaiah saw. Number two, believing in God's promise is the only way to withstand the enemy. Believing in God's promise that he's here. I'm in this. Seek my guidance. Come to me and I will be right here. We can try to let the world and its devices prop us up or we can trust in God's word. By believing God, we place ourselves in his care. What's this got to do with Christ and Christmas? Do we see what Isaiah saw? Christ came to fulfill God's prophecy. The Christ of Christmas is not just a babe in a manger. He is God with us. And what we always want to try and say is let's not leave him in the manger. Let's not leave him there as a child, as an infant of Christmas. He's someone who comes to be with us very real and alive in our lives. So God with us when we face trouble. God's with us when we're lonely. God is with us when we're fearful, when we're sad, when we're hurting, when we're trying to face the enemy, whoever and particularly whatever that enemy might be. And so as we realize he's with us, we seek his ways. We seek to do it the way that he would have us to do that, with grace and love and forgiveness. How much more do we need to see what Isaiah saw today in our day of terrorism and the world of tension? Ephesians 6.12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Should we run and hide? No. We should put on the whole armor of God and with prayer stand. Stand firm. But where does the courage to stand come from? Number three, Christ is our courage. Christ is our courage. We all need courage. Ahaz was lacking it. As we think about this, some of you have lost loved ones to death during this past year. There is a void of emptiness. There's a place that they once occupied in your life and that's empty. You battle loneliness and all kinds of emotions that come with that. The message of Emmanuel is for you. God is with you. You're not alone. In 1862, during the U.S. Civil War, General Daniel Butterfield wanted, to, wanted a new melody for Lights Out. And so without any musical training, he composed one in his head. Years later, the general wrote, I called in someone who could write music and practice to change the call of, to call it taps until I had it suit my ear. And then I it finally, it met my taste. I was finally able to put music with the words. General Butterfield gave the music to a brigade bugler and the rest is history. While there are no official lyrics to the hauntingly familiar strains of taps, there is a commonly accepted version of one verse. Day is done, gone the sun. From the hills, from the lake, from the sky, all is well. Safely rest, God is nigh. But comforting lyrics 
as faithful members of the military are laid to rest. And what hope in the acknowledgement that God is near, even especially in death. Even death, the enemy of death, cannot separate us from God. It does not separate us. He is Emmanuel, God with us through all of it. At the time when death and evil reigned, the prophet Isaiah anticipated a day when death itself would die. Later on in the book of Isaiah, it says, Your son shall no longer go down, he wrote to Israel. For the Lord will be your everlasting light. For those who follow Jesus, the strains of taps are not a funeral dirge, but a song of hope. The days of your mourning shall be ended, Isaiah says in another place. All is well, God is nigh. Sunset in one land is really a sunrise in another. Lord Jesus, help us to know that you are our courage. When we're lacking courage for whatever it is, ever how small, ever how great the enemy may be, Lord, let us know that you're looking toward us. Would you, by your Holy Spirit, cause us to look toward you and to see you and to take you in, to allow you to be in our lives as you want to be, totally involved and engaged with us in all that we're dealing with. We ask it in your loving name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand for the benediction. Now may the Lord be with you and bless you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his loving expression and give you his peace. All God's people said together, Amen.